Hello, everybody. Major General Relativity here with the next episode in my Reactor Craft tutorial series for Minecraft. The last episode, we talked about high temperature gas reactors with uh, bubble bed reactor cores and how uh, you can use carbon dioxide gas to create a closed circuit uh, coolant loop and then a heat exchanger to convert that into steam that can be run through a turbine. The mod adds a number of different reactors besides the high temperature gas reactor. The next on the list is the fission reactor, which uh, the high temperature gas reactor is actually technically a type of fission reactor, but this uh, the fission reactor in game is closer to a real world uh, boiling water fission reactor, uh, which are very common. So why not keep it? Why not stay with a high temperature gas reactor? Well, the high temperature gas reactor can't explode like the fission reactor can, but it struggles to output uh, a lot of power. The, as we discussed in the last video, the core doesn't really scale above a certain size, which means that you can't make massive reactors. And the steam output gets penalized in high pressure turbines. <clears throat> So one unit of steam is not equal to one unit of steam from a fission reactor in terms of power output. So the fission reactor scales better, which means you can get more power output. And uh, it's denser uh, because of the way it scales, which I will get into soon. Uh, so you do have to worry about the reactor melting down if it reaches a certain temperature which is why I always advise you to test your designs in a creative single player world before testing them anywhere where you wouldn't want them to blow up. So in order to get the fission reactor going, you'll need the fuel cores and some fuel. There are uranium fuel pellets and plutonium fuel pellets. Uh, so you have the plutonium fuel pellet and then the uranium fuel pellet. Uh, the plutonium fuel pellet is different from the uranium fuel pellet. You can only make it from a breeder reactor. You can't make it without having previously constructed a reactor. Uh, it produces more power per unit of time than a uranium fuel pellet. Uh, so because it produces more power and therefore more heat, you can't just take a reactor design that runs on uranium swap out the fuel pellets with plutonium fuel pellets, you'll get a different heating profile. It's very easy for the reactor to then subsequently go into meltdown because the plutonium is outputting too much heat. As of version 30A, uh, I did the math. And if I did it right, the plutonium fuel pellet is produces about twice as much heat per unit time as the uranium fuel pellet. Uh, but that can change between versions. and it but what will always stay constant is that the plutonium will output more power and you should always test the design with plutonium before using it so the basic fuel pellet is uranium fuel pellet which is formed by four enriched uranium dust and that requires a small uh but somewhat power intensive uh enrichment setup so the first step is the uranium processor which needs water. I have an Ender IO reservoir, but you could have a rotary craft dew point aggregator that pipes water in or anything else that adds water. So you need this middle slot will stay blank. The bottom slot takes raw uranium ingots. Uh, Reactor craft does use the or dictionary for this, I believe. So yellorium from big reactors, uh, which you can see up in the right will also work. Uh, and I think a mine chem adds uranium, which will also work. Um, so then you put fluorite in the top slot. Reactor craft adds a number of different colors of fluorite, and any of them will work, although obviously they cannot stack with each other. So the fluorite will begin dissolving with the water to make hydrofluoric acid. And then you'll notice that once the hydrofluoric acid appears, the uranium starts processing. And the uranium makes uh, uranium hexafluoride, which immediately got pumped out of the uranium processor and put into the isotope centrifuge. Uh, so the uranium processor does not require any power. 
it will just work by itself. It just needs the required water, fluorite, and uranium ingots. The isotope centrifuge, however, does require power. So the uranium uh, hexafluoride is a gas, so I'm pretty sure it has to be carried by the gas ducts from reactor craft. However, fluid pipes like the super laminar fluid ducts that I'm using will also carry it, and I assume that like fluid conduits from Ender.io will also carry it. The uranium hexafluoride gas must be input into the top of the uranium centrifuge. It cannot be put into the sides, and the bottom is needed for the power input, so it has to be put into the top, which it then goes in, and then it gets processed into enriched uranium dust and depleted uranium dust. The depleted uranium dust, uh, for what we're doing in this episode, is effectively useless, I think. Um, yeah, it's effectively useless, but I wouldn't throw it out because it's useful for breeder reactors, radiation protection, and other stuff that will not be discussed in this episode. So anyways, you have the isotope centrifuge, which needs a minimum speed input of 262,144 radians per second. It does not need more than one newton meter of torque, so you can gear it really efficiently to convert all the torque output from an engine, motor, whatever you have, purely into like all radians, one newton meter per second, to run the isotope centrifuge as efficiently as possible. I have a micro turbine, which, as you can see, is geared into a 16 to 1 gearbox. So this is running at 2 million radians per second. But as you can see, it's still going pretty slowly. So if you want to enrich a lot of uranium fuel at once, you will want to invest in a very, very high radian per second output. So either training multiple micro turbines together and more gearing, gas turbine, the turbine output from using steam from a high temperature gas reactor, whatever you want, it can go uh, into the centrifuge to spin it faster. Um, you don't need to construct a high temperature gas reactor before building a fission reactor. Uh, the fission reactor is a little more resource intensive though to get the most out of it. Uh, so usually I build a pebble bed reactor first and then a regular fission reactor. So you take the enriched uranium dust. Well, I don't have a crafting table, but you uh, form it like this, and then you get out the uranium fuel pellets. So then we go on over it, and we look at the reactor design. Uh, if you notice, there is an air gap between two lines of fuel cores. Originally, this was this gap was filled with control rods, which I'll talk about later. But I do want to point out that you don't need an air gap in a fission reactor, and I believe it does, in fact, cause the fuel cores to lose some heat to the air, uh, which isn't optimal. Uh, but I just wanted to point that out. So you have the fuel core. You right-click on it. It's got uh, three columns. This middle column will hold fuel pellets, uh, four of them. The side columns are holding nuclear waste. So the fuel pellets are inserted from the top. The nuclear waste and the depleted uh, pellets will be pulled out from the bottom um, and then input into a trash can. The So conduits won't pull out uh, full fuel pellets, so I don't think that it has the uh, same problem as the high temperature quote unquote problem. Uh, it is intentional behavior uh, and there is upsides to it. But so let's see. So you input fuel pellets. As you can see, they don't start falling out into the hopper below. Uh, but I believe that the reactor blocks can stack vertically, so I think it might check for like actual reactor blocks below it and not just any item handling. Uh, so then, so you have the fuel cores, you have the piping, and then you're going to want to have steam boilers. 
because without the steam boilers, there's no way to turn the heat into power and you're just wasting fuel. So the steam boilers work very similarly to the steam boilers in the high temperature gas reactor or heat exchanger. Uh, it's the same block, it works the same way, but instead of getting hot coolant from the heat exchanger, it will be absorbing hot temperature directly from the fuel core blocks. So you don't want a reactor that spends most of its time below 100 degrees Celsius because then the fuel cores are radiating heat away to the air and the steam boilers aren't converting water into steam and you're just wasting energy. However, you don't want a reactor running too hot, which I will go into a little bit later in this video. So I've got fuel cores, I've got steam boilers, and then I've got some neutron reflectors, but I will go into those in just a minute. So I put in some fuel pellets to the chest, which put the fuel pellets into the core. And you can see these little blue dots flying back and forth between the fuel cores. And you can see that now the temperature is rising. So the steam boilers are heating up and converting water into steam that go into these steam lines, which will go into a turbine. So the fuel cores, so what happens is the fuel core, every tick uh, has a chance of releasing a neutron from a uranium fuel pellet, which the neutron will fly out. And if it hits another fuel core, it has a chance of causing a fission reaction in the fuel core. Uh, so uranium and plutonium can be used together in the same reactor, uh, but obviously only one fuel at a time in fuel core. You can put you can put different types of fuel in the fuel core, but only the bottommost fuel pellet is red for the purposes of fission. So uh, stacking multiple fuel types doesn't affect the output. So the neutrons cause fission, which means that the fuel core generates some heat. It generates more neutrons. And then it also has a chance of generating nuclear waste. So the nuclear waste, the proper way to handle it is to put it in a uh, spent fuel container. Uh, so there's dry cask for waste with a long storage time. And then there is a separate block for... Uh, Well, it's in there. Uh, there's a separate block for handling waste that has short half lives that has to be immersed in water, but I'll be covering that in a later video. You can also do it the wrong way, uh, wrong way, and put all the waste into a trash can or equivalent block. Uh, you cannot put the nuclear waste into a chest because it will generate radiation in the world, which is bad. And I don't believe that it can be stored safely in an applied energistics ME system. I think Reka added code where it will damage the drives. I'm not sure what exactly that entails, but I'm pretty sure that you're not able to just put in an ME system without suffering any consequences. Uh, so what's interesting is that the power output of a fuel core does not scale linearly with the amount of fuel cores in our reactor. Because each fuel core you add means that there's more reactions going on. And as there's more reactions, there's more neutrons being emitted, which trigger more reactions in existing fuel cores. So the power output isn't linear, it's exponential. And the waste, heat, uh, fuel lifetime all correlate directly with that. So it doesn't make it more fuel efficient. It just increases all the values, except for fuel lifetime, which of course goes down. So what this means is that you can't have an infinitely large reactor without very careful planning, uh, because eventually the fuel core, even if it's surrounded by four steam boilers, will uh, it will heat itself up so much that it can't transfer enough heat to the steam boilers to avoid melting down. So be careful when you're scaling out your reactor. Always double check these things in a separate creative world to make sure that the design works. I did once see a 
an online calculator for our reactor craft that would sim attempt to simulate a reactor, but I'm pretty sure that I saw a different output in the calculator than I did in the game. So I would always take those results with a grain of salt and double check these things. And what you want to do is you want to leave the reactor running for a few hours at least, because the each neutron impacting a fuel core only has a chance of causing a fission reactor reaction. And what this means is that RNG has a chance to cause transient power spikes where all the numbers add up so that the a lot of neutrons are causing fission reactions instead of being absorbed or passing through the block. And what that means is all of a sudden you have suddenly have a much higher temperature. And if you're already riding near the temperature of the meltdown, pushing over that is not great. Um, in, an, in an ideal world, like your fission reactor would probably sit in the low, about, always above 100, but like in the low hundreds. Um, so that way it's always outputting to the steam boilers, but it's far away from a meltdown point. So your reactor has the thermal headroom to absorb a power transient. So uh, that brings up the neutron economy of your reactor. Neutron economy is a topic in real world nuclear reactors. And with the power of reactor craft, it's now a topic for Minecraft nuclear reactors. So as you notice, I have three blocks of neutron reflectors on every side of the fuel core. I don't have any neutron reflectors in this middle air gap area because the neutrons always fly out in a straight line on the four uh, ax the horizontal axes of the fuel course. There is an optional configuration setting to enable vertical neutron propagation. However, that is set to false by default, so I won't be discussing it in this video. Uh, so the neutrons fly out on the four horizontal axes. The neutron reflectors have a chance of bouncing the neutrons back towards the fuel core. Why is this important? Well, even if the uranium pellet doesn't cause, the neutron emitted from the uranium or plutonium pellet doesn't cause a fission reaction, it still has a chance of depleting the pellet. So any neutron that flies out, it represents wasted uranium or plutonium. And so if you bounce it back, you recover that lost energy, you increase the reaction rate of your reactor, and that means that you can make the reactor core smaller for the same amount of power. I use three blocks. Uh, however, as you can see, I'm still losing some neutrons. Uh, so you could add on a fourth, fifth layer, whatever you want, or you could do with less layers if you already have a larger reactor, or if you want to control the neutron flux in a certain part of the reactor core. So uh, I mentioned that there were control rods. Uh, there are control rods that are controlled by a control central control block, uh, the controller CPU, which must be powered. The uh, book says that it's 1,024 watts per control rod. So because the steam engine outputs 16 kilowatts, one steam engine just going sh uh, bevel gear straight into the central control will get you control over 16 control rods. However, as of version 31A of Reactor Craft, every time I try to retract a control rod, my game crashes. So I can't currently demonstrate them. But you could use them uh, the, to control the reaction rate. Also, the central control, if it, the temperature of the reactor gets too high, it will fully insert all the control rods. You could use this as a last ditch effort to control your reactor. Obviously, now your reactor is shut off, but at least it's not exploding. Uh, then one other thing I wanted to bring up was heavy water. Uh, reactor craft adds heavy water, which is water where the hydrogen atoms are replaced with deuterium atoms. Uh, deuterium is another isotope of hydrogen, and it, heavy water is a real liquid used in some real-world reactors, like the Canadian CANDU designs. In reactor craft, the heavy water is 
interesting. By default, the moderation system for neutrons is turned off. So putting heavy water into a steam boiler, it's not it's not really going to do a whole lot for you. Uh, steam boilers with regular water have a chance of absorbing neutrons. However, with heavy water, they don't have that chance. So if you were interested in running a really, really neutron efficient reactor, you could replace the regular water with heavy water. However, in the all the reactor designs I've built, the problem usually isn't pushing the reactor up above 100 degrees Celsius, but rather controlling it so it doesn't melt down. So I don't find it to be uh, the most useful, but if you were interested in the design maximizing neutron efficiency, I believe that you could replace the regular water in the steam boilers with heavy water. It'll turn into regular steam that could be passed through a turbine. Uh, let's see. So I will talk briefly about shielding. Uh, there are a number of blocks. Most of the blocks are added by reactor craft. However, there are a couple of vanilla blocks. Uh, the block that I like to use a lot is concrete which is made by clay, sand, gravel, and water pocket. Uh, if you have Mine Factory Reloaded, you can use a liquid crafter to craft with just, pipe, you pipe water into the liquid crafter and it can use that instead of a water bucket so you can automate the crafting. But if you notice, so before there were lots of neutrons flying out this side of the reactor, but I put down a few blocks of concrete and there are not neutrons flying out. They're not being reflected back into the reactor like the neutron reflectors, they're being absorbed, um, which has, a, I believe, a small chance of creating radiation, but I'm pretty sure it's either a zero chance or very, very small because I've run reactors for weeks nonstop and I haven't seen too much radiation. In another video, talking more about nuclear meltdowns, how to handle radiation, all that. I'll go into depth about these different types of blocks. But the two of the ones I know that are good are concrete, which is very cheap, and HSLA steel blocks added by Rotary Craft. So I believe that that covers everything about the basics of building a nuclear fission reactor. Uh, power generation, waste disposal, I'll be talking about in separate videos. But as you scale up, you get more steam boilers. So for instance, if I added a fifth block on to each row, I could pro probably afford to add some steam boilers in the middle to absorb some more heat as the temperature goes up. Actually, um, I will discuss a little bit about uh, meltdown. So they will, if the fuel core gets too hot, it will begin smoking, which is harmless. Uh, by itself, releasing hydrogen gas and will eventually melt and release large amounts of radiation. So this releasing hydrogen gas is pretty bad. Uh, by itself, I'm pretty sure that the hydrogen gas is capable of igniting if there are flames nearby. So I would, if you're planning on running a hot reactor, I would light the area up with like glowstone or any of like the magical illumination focuses from uh, Thomcraft. I believe Chromaticraft has some alternative lighting sources too. That way you want to avoid anything with fire to avoid setting off the hydrogen gas. If the reactor emits too much hydrogen for too long uh, at a high enough temperature, which I, I believe right now is above, I think it's like 1400 degrees, but I, I could be wrong. Don't, don't quote me on that exact uh, figure. Uh, but if it emits it for too long, then the reactor core itself can explode. And it's a non-nuclear explosion, which means that it won't convert to corium or anything. But because it's an explosion, it's likely that it will knock out some of the cooling ducts for nearby steam boilers which means that your other fuel cores will heat up and run the risk of exploding in nuclear explosions. And that becomes very bad. So you'll definitely want to keep your reactors in the triple digits, so below 1,000 degrees Celsius, if at all possible. 
And I think that that does actually cover everything about the basics of building a fission reactor in ReactorCraft. I hope to see you in the next video where we'll talk more about breeder reactors, which still run on nuclear fission, but offer exciting fuel possibilities.